you. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. I was telling Dr. Little that um, we like the weather outside. It's very encouraging because for us to move in here. So I know you're not missing anything for being out, not being out there. So I want to talk today about stretching exercises as a therapeutic tool for impaired mobility in older adults. And I'm hoping at the end of my talk, you will be able to kind of describe why stretching should be used as an exercise, why we do it, especially in the management of pain, and what are the benefits, what are the risks, and why you should, if somebody has any indications that you have learned, why you should think about physical therapy um, as a, an alternative to uh, medications. So stretching itself, everyone does it, right? Babies, young people, older people, People of all ages stretch. So why would I say stretching as an exercise? Most of us stretch to improve flexibility. Most of us stretch after sitting for a long time or after assuming a position for a long time, then we move out of that position gradually by stretching. That's what we normally do because sometimes when you get up from the, assuming the same position over a period of time, you go, ouch, ow, oh, I didn't do that very well. But naturally, our body reflexes kick in and ask us to move out of that position that we have assumed uh, for a little while. That is a reflexive response for flexibility that the body asks for naturally. So that's why it, go, it cuts across ages. But sometimes you stretch the mouth because you are hungry or you are bored. But in order for me to paint this picture of stretching as a therapeutic tool, I need to introduce you to Miss Lucy Tideback. She's a 72-year-old female, and she presented with severe back pain. And when she was asked uh, to give me an idea of her um, history. Now, I, I am a practicing physical therapist in home care environment. So I saw her in her home. And she said, well, this just came on slowly, and it just got worse gradually. And, you know, it started with my back, but my legs give me a lot more pain, the left one especially more than the right. And she brought in a MRI report, everything on a CD. We put it in the computer, and she, nothing there beyond what you expect. And our doctor had cleared her that, oh, yeah, you have mild stenosis all through your lower back, and you have this little lipoma. It won't bother you unless it becomes something, and I will pay attention to it. She's had two steroid injections. And Ms. Tideback has had previous outpatient therapy. So for me to come into the house now, you know that it must be something that she's not able, that's limited her function, she's not able to drive herself out. But she also remembers that, yes, yeah, she feels good with the outpatient therapy, but most of the time the pain relief is short-lived. And the doctor said, okay, I'm going to put you on Percocet, but she doesn't like that as much, even though he said as needed. She doesn't like it because she said it makes her constipation worse. She normally is constipated. Okay, why, why do you think your doctor wants me to see you in your house? Well, because I can't sleep. Of a seven-hour range at night, Miss Lucy said that she can only sleep maybe about two, two and a half hours at a time. She has to get up, and not for the bathroom, but to just kind of move a position around. She gets relief by being in fetal position. That's a clue for me, and you'll see as we go on. And when she, she, she's able to walk, but she can only take a few steps, and then the back pain gets worse. So walking, it's not a good thing for Miss Lucy, okay? Uh, pain is very agonizing once she moves beyond the three feet. Now, the third injection, because our doctor told her she can get three, but the third one, he puts on hold and said, let me just try you with this home physical therapy first and see where we go from there. If that doesn't work, I'll give you the shot. If that doesn't work, we just fuse your back, and that would be the last result. Now, she is, was very afraid for um, having spinal surgery because she said she's heard some good things but a lot of bad things about it. Okay, so the PT prescription was, okay, evaluate and treat, which was great because 
Most of us, PT wants you to give us, the, the physician to give us, kind of just give us a free range. Let's look first and decide. And that means that I was able to pinpoint for Ms. Tight Back that, okay, cryo massage will be okay for you and stretching exercises will be appropriate for you. I had to quickly move away from heart pack because she had had that in our patient and she said it works, but it's very short term. Heart pack only relieves about three to four hours. It's very superficial. Now, cryotherapy, which is ice, goes about six to eight hours longer because you get through the cold first and then the warmth comes in and then there is pain, uh, nociceptor uh, dispersor, which prolongs the relief that you have. And stretching exercises, the reason why we are sitting here. But you can see that I didn't say just cryotherapy. I was very specific about saying it's cryomassage. Why? Because on palpation of our back, I could pinpoint tender areas. So I want to use my little ice cube and go slowly for about two minutes, not the 15, 20 minute or pack, um, cold pack treatment that she's used to. No, this is very pointed and very specific and very focused on the history she's presenting to me. So stretching exercises. It's an exercise. Now, I had told you earlier that, okay, everybody stretches, but stretching becomes an exercise. Just like any physical activity becomes an exercise, the moment it is structured, the moment it is focused, the moment it has a regimen. So there is a difference between physical activity and exercises. If I'm walking up and down this room, there must be a reason for me to do it, or, or else all of you that are MDs here will say, oh, honey, you, you, we need to check you out. But if I tell you that I have to get 5,000 steps because I need half a mile to go, then, oh, you are doing your exercises. But if I'm just doing it just for fun, uh, to get my bag or I forgot my pen, that's physical activity. If it's not focused, if it's not structured, if it's not purposeful, then it is not an exercise. But in this case, stretching exercises, any term, and it's a generic term that we use as a therapeutic maneuver to increase that mobility of soft tissue. Because I said we all stretch to improve flexibility. Now, I am going in what part of flexibility of soft tissues. So, stretching exercises, the purpose here, I said it, it ha an exercise has to be purposeful, has to be focused. Stretching exercises for Miss Lucy tight back is the purpose is to improve the range of motion. That's the aspect of it that we are bringing in. Because I, I mentioned to you that she assumed a fetal uh, position, a flexed position when she's in pain. She just wants to hold herself uh, forward flexed and that kind of gives us some relief. But it doesn't allow her to walk further as she would like to walk. Over time, as we age, we become hypo mobile. And the ligaments between the bones, between the joints, they shorten. Over time, our muscles become hypomobile, and we're gonna look at that in a minute. So all this makes a great indication for prescribing stretching exercises for Miss Lucy tight back. If I'm going to improve flexibility, I want to improve the range of motion. So what flexibility am I looking at with regards to Miss Lucy tight back? I'm looking at the amount, the measure of the amount of joint movement that she has. I have to be able to quantify it to see at what point does she get that pain? Is it normal or is it abnormal? What, how do I classify a degree of hypo mobility that she has? Does, does that contribute to the gradual increase in pain that she feels as she walks um, on, uh, daily? But I have to look at our age because those are factors that affect flexibility. As we grow older, we said that age is a negative, uh, is inversely proportional to our uh, flexibility. So flexibility, age increases, flexibility decreases. Age is a negative indicator. When you're young, you are able to move, as you see in the previous slide, you are able to double over and do things without thinking about it. But the joint anatomy changes as we age it. And the activity level changes. But that's a vicious cycle. Because 
decreased activity decreases joint movement. When, this is when it is true that when you don't use it, you lose it. But as a woman, compared to a 72-year-old man, we have even more tendency, more propensity to decrease inflexibility in our joint, uh, in our soft joints, in, in our soft tissues. So we have to look at how all these factors, age, activity level, joint anatomy, and the gender of the person, how they inter, uh, correlate with flexibility that we are trying to help her with. Okay, so this is in Spanish. But I like it because I had presented Ms. Tide back to you that she said that, oh, uh, both legs hurt, but the left one hurt more than the right. In this instance, the physician said, well, you know, the pain in your right leg is because of old age. And the gentleman said, well, the left one is the same age too, and it doesn't hurt. So sometimes the, the, what I'm describing to you as the interrelationship between age, sex, it, it, does, it doesn't always occur evenly bilaterally. The symptoms that you present with are not always equal. So I, did, I don't want to read that in Spanish for you, but at least that's the idea. And I, I did translate it verbatim, so you know. So with Ms. Lucy Tideback, she presented with lower extremity pain. She presented with lower back pain. But Ms. Lucy is not worried as much with the back pain as she is with the leg pain, and the left more than the right. She has an indication for stretching exercises because with stretching exercises, this is the map that we look at. Does she have pain that is causing limited range of motion? She won't see it that way, but this is the algorithm that most of the patients follow. Now, one may be missing, but generally, that's an overarching uh, picture that we have. So, when you have limited range of motion, I mentioned that when you don't use it, you lose it, okay? When, when you don't move as much, muscles are made to move. That's why they are hand joints, they are ball and socket, they are all kinds. They are made to move. The, the, the muscles have to contract to bring about joint movement. If they are not using them, the innervation kind of decreases. The neural activity that is supposed to be sending the information from the executive center, you lose it over time. That's a basic physiological fact that's been established over the years. That leads to muscle weakness. Muscle weakness is not only the atrophy in the bulk of the muscle, it's also what is there. Is everything firing most of the time? No. And if they're not firing, they just sit there. So they assume that same safe position. There is no lengthening and contraction, nothing. So, and gradually, they go back to shorter and shorter. So, shortening of the muscle, and there may be decrease in functional activities. So, if my shoulder is not used to moving much, if I don't challenge it, all I do most of the time is that I will never get to this point because I need to stretch my latissimus muscle in order to actually reach. But if all the time all I do is this, I'm within my comfort zone. After a while, muscles adapt to that, and that's what I deal with. But pain will come when I challenge it, maybe once in a blue moon, and I say, oh, oh, that just went cracked. Oh, that feels out of place. And then I'm dealing with shoulder pain. I'm dealing with something else. Now, that's the simplest frame I could put this. We know that there may be other uh, things going on in the body. So, whether it's muscle weakness that is leading to structural deformity, which may see as contractures or adhesions within the joint, or scar tissue, probably post-surgical procedure, or post-fall, or post-strain, decrease in functional activity may circle back and lead to muscle weakness. So, this will be best seen as a circle, but that's not the way they present it to us, and, but this is the way to look at it, but how, how you are thinking about it, think that they can be interrelated. And ladies and gentlemen, please stop me at any time. I don't have a long train of thought, so I can always circle back to what I'm talking about. So 
I have all the indications from Ms. Tideback, but then I have to make sure that I clear out certain things. She's 72 years old. In order for me to apply stretching exercises, I have to make sure there are no yellow flags and there are no red flags. Red flags are contraindications. I mean, even if she has indication for stretching exercises, am I sure that all this are not in play? If they are, if any of them is in play, then I can apply. It doesn't matter how qualified she is for stretching exercises. So if there is a bony block, if there is no union of a fracture, even if it's hairline fracture that the doctor just said, uh, let it see it and let's see what's happening. Remember, she's 72 year old and we'll see why that matters. Or if the lipoma is not lipoma, I didn't get a clearance from a physician, she, he, he said, oh, that may be cancerous or that may be something, oh well, I better leave it alone. Then I cannot use stretching exercises. Or if the pain is not chronic, if it's a sharp, acute, pain and she's not able to tell me how and what she did, then she goes right back to the doctor. It's as simple as saying, uh, I'm sorry, uh, she, uh, PT is contraindicated at this time because it's acute pain. PT, we do see acute pain, but you have to be able to tell us why and when. Also, if there's any hematoma in our back or our leg or anywhere that I'm going to stretch, and if there is hyper, Mobility. She already has the mobility. Then all I have shown you in the indications will not come into play. But sometimes there may be hypomobility, decrease in range of motion. If that decrease in range of motion is providing stability for her, if it's allowing her to function and decreasing our loss, a risk of loss of balance that may lead to fall, I cannot take her out of that. It's like having a three-legged stool. If I pull, mobility is one of the legs. If I take it out, she will be unstable. She will lose her balance. She will have increased risk of fall. I cannot do that. It still would not be indicated. So all the other tests that we do has to rule out all this in order for me to proceed with stretching exercises. Why? Because the outcome I'm looking for is, yes, I want to lengthen shortened tissue. I want to restore the range of motion. I also want her to be able to walk again. And she has to have muscles that are ready to fire for the contraction of whether the agonist or the antagonist or the teenagers. They have to be ready to get up at any time when they are called upon. And it doesn't matter what I ask her to do. I don't want her to come back and say, you know, I hurt all, a, a lot after that because adherence will be low after that. And we just talked about balance. Even if I cleared her and there is no more risk of uh, loss of balance, she has no contraindication, I have to make sure that what she's doing does not increase our risk of injury and she won't fall. Whatever I prescribe to her, whatever activity I prescribe to her, she mo she, the risk of, uh, loss of balance, the risk of fall has to be extremely low because of this special, she's in a special population. And there's a study that came out about two years ago and they found out that stretching and strengthening actually works better than strengthening alone because when you have somebody undergo resistance exercises uh, to um, increase their strength or to decrease rate of loss of muscle fibers, most of the time you will have decreased range of motion. Decreased range of motion leads to risk of increased risk of fall. But when you couple stretching and strengthening exercises together, you have a better outcome. So that's the outcome I'm looking for for Miss Lucy Tideback. Because connective tissue we know physiologically gives us a response based on the stress strain curve. We, there is elasticity, that's why you can pull the biceps out and pull it back in. All right. But I'm also looking at the fact that if the muscle assumes this level of range of motion, this is all I can get, and I need it to come that much, 
elasticity means he starts from here, he gets there. It's reversible. He starts from here, he gets there. I want to get into that stress strain curve into the plastic range. You all know that plastic means that new shape can be assumed. So elasticity, it comes back, and I take her to just before the pain. It's not true when people say physical therapists are physical terrorists. We don't cause pain. We don't like pain. No, we don't. We take them just before the pain, and we ask them to relax, and we crack it. But if they are mean, you know what happens when people are mean to you. You want to cause them a little bit of pain, and then you walk back and say, I'm sorry, but that helps. <laughs> so in this case, that's actually what I want to do, and it's for our own uh, goodness. So I'm going to go beyond the elastic range, go into the plastic range, gradually, slowly, never into the failure range of the muscle. No, the surgeons do that. What am I looking for? I'm lo I go slowly, I go gradually, I talk to her because I actually like the Golgi's. I want the GTO response. I want to shut down the muscle spindles. If I go fast, let's stretch. You've seen that on, on the floor, I know, but we don't always do that. That's for a different purpose. But when I do that, I'm actually activating the muscle spindles and shutting down the GTOs. But when I go gradual and I keep talking to her, she will want to work with me by relaxing and the GTO activity is increased. That has been proved over and over uh, before I was born and it's been confirmed with research. The slow stretching alter, reverse the neural activity. So, I examined Miss Lucy type back. I told you I palpated her, I did all the tests. I know she was appropriate for cryotherapy. And in preparation for the stretching, which is the next step, I talked to her why and what we're going to be doing. Now, we have to go through that stretching in order for you to be able to examine and evaluate what uh, after stretching procedures she can go through. But before we go through the hands-on on stretching, we have to make sure that we remember Miss Lucy Tideback is a 72-year-old female, and research has shown over and over in this population, we have loss of muscle mass. We have loss of bone density. So the elasticity that I said is a good thing and it's wonderful, it allows movement, it lets things happen, is decreased. Because fibrosis is increased a lot. Fatty tissue don't move much. And fibrotic tissues don't move much. Real collagenous muscle with high protein moves a lot. That is a big factor. Why? Because that will guide me to use what we call FET. Frequency has to be kept in mind. The intensity of the stretching exercises has to be kept in mind. The type of the stretching exercise has to be kept in mind and how long, the time. So frequency, intensity, time, and type. That's very specific for this lady. How do I decide? I go back to what I found on the evaluation. I go back to what she told me, because that's what I'm going to use as markers for improvement. And with the SARC and the frail score, you can see that, yeah, she does have sarcopenia, but she's pre-frail. That's a great thing. That tells me how long I'm likely to see her for, and when I'll set her free, how quickly what the prognosis for physical therapy at home would look like. So I said time. Let's look at that fit. I kind of take them all over, but if I do T, T, F, I, I don't know what that would mean, but so I will stick with fit and then go through each of the components of the fit. So, but let's start with type. You can see that dynamic stretching would not be appropriate from Miss Lucy. She's 72, and this young man that you see here is not 72. He doesn't look 72. 
I am actually going to use static stretching for Miss Lucy, but not the kind you see at Magic House with the kids, because I mean, you can see all the electricity coming out. Not that kind, but a different kind. But we get into that in a little bit. For me to have chosen static stretching, then I have to make sure again, I check my boxes. The static stretching for her cannot be selective. It cannot be just one joint. Remember, she has leg problems, she has back problems. So it's multi-jointed, okay. She's been walking around like that because that's that position of comfort. I cannot take her out of that without giving her something back. So I, I have to watch out for activities that may make her lose her balance and fear of falling will shoot through the roof. I can't do that. So that's a yellow flag. That's why I call it a precaution. And I have to make sure that we ease in into that static stretching, even though it's static. It has to be eased into because insufficient warm-up will lead to outcomes that we do not anticipate. And I, the physical therapist, have to provide effective stabilization. If I'm not able to do that, if my stabilization is ineffective, then I can't go on with that. I have to look for something else. And going back to intensity, our age matters. Our indicators matter, but also how long she can do it for, how much she can tolerate. I can't just come in and say, okay, let's go. No. And if she has any abnormal biomechanics that she has developed for that comfort, I have to look at them as a whole. Because she moves this, she hasn't been moving that a lot. So when I fix this, I'm going to have to deal with this because it has not moved much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, since you have a physical therapist talking to you, I would like you to please humor me by standing up. Thank you. Okay, now, place your hands. Uh oh, no, Dr. Little, you can't just wave at me. <laughs> you have to place your hand on the small of your back. Yes, ma'am. No, you cannot. Don't do that then. You're <laughs> I'll find something else for you. Thank you for telling me. Uh, yes, that's what I'm going to do. I'm coming to her. Okay. You just wait. Why do you have to spoil the show? <laughs> so those that are able, place your hand on the stomach. Don't start yet. I'm watching you. Okay. Now, I need you to lean over the heel of your hand. Don't push the heel of your hand. Lean over the heel of your hand. That means you have to curve the thoracic spine. Yes, yes, and yes, and over, and yes, and yes, and back. Okay. I'm coming to you. Now, you all wait for me one second. Because <laughs> I could see her trying to do it without the hands. There is a reason I said the hands. Oh, now you think I'm a physical therapist. Okay. I'm going to put my hand here, just yeah. one hand. Okay. All right. You cannot bend or push my hand. This level is where my thumb is. You have to bend over my hand. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. That's it. And back. Slowly. <laughs> Did you hear anything? I said, all right. Great. And stop. Stop. Come back. Okay, now, over the heel of my hand, above the heel. Don't worry about this. When you feel me push on your stomach, that means you're pushing my heel. I don't want that. Go. Lean back, slowly, slowly. Use your shoulder and stop. Great. Come back real slow. Come with me. Come with me. Great. Any difference? between the thumb one and the heel one. I like the thumb one better. <laughs> okay, all right, have a seat. All, oh, please have a seat. Now, thank you for saying that, and I did not coach her, yes. I wasn't gonna, I never say it's the right answer, but yes, it is. Okay, so what you just did was 
And that's extremely important to me. I don't want people to bend the lower back. We have the most movement between L4-5 in the back. That's why we have the most movement. If a 72-year-old is going to have arthritis, if there's going to be decrease in the interdiscal space, it's going to be in that area first. If there's going to be pain shooting through the leg, then it's going to be at that area. So I don't want you L shaping your back. Most of us bend like that. I need you to bend like that. And that's what she just told. Now, the rest of you that did it on your own, it should feel good if you went slowly. If you didn't, let me know, because I'll come around. <laughs> OK. All right. That's important. But for somebody in pain, they don't know what you just got up and you did. No, they won't be able to do that. So I come in, and I use that external force. That was my thumb saying, this is where I am. Don't cross this line and come over me. That's what you see as manual or mechanical stretching. Let's assume I lose my hands. I, I still want to be a therapist, so I use a belt or I use a machine to get the same thing. That's mechanical. But when I use my hands, that's manual. It's still an external force to generate the movement that you're trying to teach the patient. We are still on type. When she's able to do that with, with me just saying, can you Feel my hand. Don't do anything. I'm going to do it for you first. That's passive. That's the lowest level of stretching exercises. But when I say now, can you help me a little bit, bring you back, that's assisted active with the patient's assistance. Now, I will have to quantify whether it's minimum assistance, moderate assistance, maximum assistance the patient is giving me. That's up to me to feel how much. But both of us are working together. With passive, I'm doing all the work. With assisted active, I'm assisting the patient to carry out the movement. Now, with active active, that's self-stretching. And I'm going to show you what actually Miss Lucy Tideback's regimen looks like. She has to perform the stretch. She has to, I have to make sure that cognitively, she's good to go. She understands my instruction, and she will not hurt herself. So back to the one I keep emphasizing, that yes, I don't want her to fall. Yes, I want her biomechanics to be good. Yes, I want her coordination to be great. That's why it matters. So frequency, intensity, time, and type. What plane of motion? We are moving that way, frontal. And how long? She, most of the time, I count potatoes. I don't like Mississippi because I used to work in Louisiana and live there. So is it that one Louisiana, but that doesn't sound good. Everybody counts Mississippi. So I went with one potato, two potato, every part, unless you're from Idaho, every part of the United States eats potato in one way or form, you know. But at least potato is neutral. So one potato, and we've timed this, it, it seems neutral. And we timed this, and we actually realized that it's accurate. So we need 20 to 30 seconds of stretching three times. So for me to get you into that plasticity that I, I want to promote, if you're a patient, what we just did now, I will say, OK, let's do it one time, uh, time in, and come back. And let's do it again, time in, and come back, and let's do it. That's one set. The three is one set. Now, how many times a day? How many days in the week? So she did the three sets. And I said, OK, now rest a little bit. I need you to do it every two hours. I need you to do it every four hours. I need you to do it before bed or immediately you, get out, you wake up in the morning before you get out of bed. So that dosage depends on what I'm looking at with the patient. And how many times a week? It depends. For Ms. Lucy tied back, I remember where we're coming from. She has to be every day, every two hours. And especially the moment she opens her eyes, Ms. Lucy, I don't want you to get up at all. I need you to turn over if you are able or lie on your side. And I need you to push yourself to the back. You can put a pillow on the lower uh, back and move over that pillow. 
But before you step out of bed at all, I need you to do that. Why? Because it matters. If I'm too aggressive with her, I'm going to do more damage than she, a physician, even I, am expecting. I, I said, be careful, be careful, be careful. Okay, because we don't want to tear the little soft muscle mass that she has. We don't want her to have that muscle soreness. If she has any other kind of pain beyond what she's presenting with, adherence level, whatever I'm telling her, she, she doesn't know what she's doing, that foreign-speaking girl, I'm not doing whatever else she's asking me to do. That will happen, and it would not be anything personal. It will be because of my approach to her, and I can't blame her. Okay, so to remind you again, I am going to focus on our lower extremities. But how? I'm going to focus on our lower extremity pain through our back. My hand placement matters, my position matters, and the procedure matters. So, I have to move up because you all are over there and you make me feel inadequate. So, it's a great thing that you're there because at least you can see that my left leg is what I'm going to move. I'm not going to fall. Oh. <gasps> so, I was right with the biomechanics. See, I won't put Miss Lucy Tide back on this kind of place, but you have to understand that this is the closest to you. But that's what I'm talking about at risk of fall. I have to, I have to take Miss Lucy to our bedroom to do this same movement. So, is the back. I'm going to do combined movement. And we're going to get there. But for you to just see the hand placement, I am the therapist. I stand on the outside of Miss Lucy. Even though we're on our bed, it's a good height for her. It's our bed. It's our home. And she gets to there and tells me, that, 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 that's my pain. Okay. So my hand placement is going to be on our shoulder. My hand placement is going to be on our knee. My body is on the right side of the hip. I'm here. One hand over there, one hand over here. We'll do it and you'll be my model. I like you. Sure. <laughs> not yet, not yet. I'll come back. I'll come back. I'm just, you know, marketing to you kind of. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so that matters. Hand placement, position, procedure. Keep this in mind. Most stretching that you see that is not just for therapeutic exercise. This is just for me. I do yoga. I do tai chi. I do, you know, just to be healthy. You will see them as one movement. Either you are going down or you are long sitting. They are great when you are using them for preventive purposes. And research has shown they actually work. But what we are doing for Ms. Lucy's eye back, remember, it's focused, it's purposeful, we have a goal. So we have to combine the movement. Yeah, we have to combine movement for Ms. Lucy. I do want that long sitting. I do want that knee straight that we just saw here. That on the right side, right there. I want that. But Miss Lucy cannot assume this position. I know what I just showed you before with the extension stretching is not appropriate for her because I kept telling you that Miss Lucy walks like that and Miss Lucy finds a position of comfort that way. I don't want to take her out of that. But the way she's doing it is making the pain worse. We call it prevarilization. When the pain starts in the back, and it goes down, radiculopathy, radiating down the leg, for us, that's a bad thing. Now, if I'm treating the back and the pain keeps coming down, he was at the heel, then now it's not my knee. Oh, Miss Lucy, that's wonderful. That's wonderful? Yes, ma'am, that's really great. And the next time she comes, it's at my heel. What about your heel and your knee? No, no more. Ma'am, we keep doing what we're doing. In fact, I'm going to increase the dosage. That is what we call centralization. So it's not going down, 
it's coming back up. That's wonderful. I have ways to go, I'll get my paycheck. That's the way we think about it. So we are going to do combined movement. And what combined movement we do to get to that. Now I need my model. Would you mind? I'm going to stay with you. No. I'll make sure. We'll have to use them. Yeah, great. I picked the right person. Yay. Sorry, I forgot the microphone is on. Okay. Go in. And I want you to sit. Try to sit. Yeah. What I just did. Yeah, I'll be by your side. Okay. Now I need you to scoot out. So you're only sitting on one buttock. Yes, sir. I got you. I'm good. I got you. Okay. <laughs> He's right, you look at this. Different from what I showed you in the picture. It's not 72, but it's close. Okay. Half that. <laughs> I need you to try to reach to your toes. Do I straighten my? Uh, no, we are pretending you have pain, okay. Great, now, lean out. You see this? I need you to touch it. Yes, and push your heels down as, okay. Mm -mm. No. Touch with your toes. Oh. Yes, that's yeah. because you don't have pain. So I really can't make up anything with you. Now I'm going to stretch this out a little bit. Okay. Both hands towards your toes. Ah, that's it. Go more. <laughs> Go more. Now push this knee down. There you go. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Really, naturally, for him, that's it. Okay, now push your heel down and this knee down, and we go together. Oh, yeah, there and you we feel go it. together. There I and feel we it. go together. Okay. This is physical and torture. We go <laughs> <laughs> and we go together. There we go. Wonderful. That's it. Real slow. All right. Oh, come on now. You, you mean go all the way down? It. No, you don't have to. I got you where I need you. Right. right there. Good. Yeah, keep looking at that knee. Okay. Wonderful. Great, wonderful, great. And let's go back up. Let's go back up. Hands up first. Yes, and now relax. Great, and relax. <laughs> I was yeah. counting it silently. I didn't want him to start laughing. I had to count no, the potatoes. It's almost natural. <laughs> yeah, you can feel it all. Yes. Yeah. So what you felt from the back all the way down, that's what Miss Lucy had to do. Thank you. Sure. That's combined movement. As he's pushing down his knee, he's pushing down the heel, he's bending forward. Miss Lucy already has the kyphosis, so I just need to work with it. And the leaning forward stretches where she hasn't really stretched before. That's by combined movement for Miss Lucy tied back. Thank you so much. You're Welcome. such a good sport. All right. So stretching exercises, we combine the movement, not just single movement that we had seen that most of us do because of wellness. This is a therapeutic maneuver. And at the end of the week, I had to see Miss Lucy three times that week. I, she wanted me to come every day. I said, ma'am, you know, I got you late. I'm just um, going to try to fix you, uh, put you in about three times and let's see what goes. But I was able to see her three times because Miss Lucy, right immediately after the treatment, she said, oh, just like what he said. Oh, that feels good. I thought you were going to hurt me. I said, me, look at this face. Don't hurt nobody. <laughs> she yeah, <laughs> did it. <laughs> yeah, I should stretch the other side because you're normal. <laughs> I should not leave him kind of lopsided. Yeah. But, but that's what she said almost immediately. So I'm encouraged that, okay, now we can do it. So I said, ma'am, we do it three times, but I'm leaving now. I need you to do this around 4 o'clock again. Please call me. If it becomes burning or if it feels like ants crawling down your feet, call me. Why? Because I want to yell at her and say, don't do it anymore. Stop it. But she doesn't know that. I just said, this what you have is what I'm expecting. If it's anything beyond that, call me. That's day one, Monday. I come back, I saw her at two o'clock on Monday, I come back at eight o'clock on Wednesday. Guess what? 
I was able to sleep. I got up only one time, and that's to pee. And I'm like, oh, Miss Lucy, you are a darling. That's why I like older people. They not only bake you cookies, you can call them darling, and they're not offended, or they don't think it's sexual harassment. So that's a great thing for me. So she, when she said that, I'm looking at my indicators. Oh, well, she used to sleep uh, only two hours or a little bit before. Okay, that's good. Now, give me your pain score. I said, well, you know, I, can, I, I could uh, cook for Arthur, a husband. I could cook and do that, and, but the pain comes back. Then I smile, and I said, Miss Lucy, you were walking 10 feet before, and the pain was 7 to 8 over 10. Now you are cooking breakfast and making sandwiches before the pain comes back. That's a great thing. And then I said, ma'am, I will be seeing you twice a week, but I need you now to stretch more, not just every two hours. I need you to start walking around your neighborhood, and immediately you come back, do that same stretching. She was confused, but she didn't know, I need to increase our functional level. I need to increase aerobic capacity. She's been walking like that forever. And I need to challenge her to make sure when I leave that house, she's able to either go to outpatient or return to normal activity. So I have to quickly pull things in, but slowly removing our dependence on me. So at this charge, so it was three times a week for two weeks, two times a week for two weeks, one time a week for the next eight weeks. One time. And it could be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. There wasn't a specific day. One time. And it's just, oh, let me see how you're doing it. Show me what you've been doing. And yes, she started at a little bit, maybe 45 degree flexion. I need her to get, you see, I don't feel anything until I get way down there. Oh, yes, ma'am, that's a good thing. And now she's able to go up and down the stairs. I could ask her to walk quickly. I could ask her to walk slowly. How about walking around the neighborhood? I'll time you. And she's fine. Now I go back to my outcome measures, this arc and the frail score. That was what I had with. But you see, I didn't leave her at numerical pain score of zero. No, because she had a chronic condition. So I'm, I wasn't expecting to, give her, to take her to zero. No, it, it would have been wonderful, but no, I wasn't expecting that. But functionally, she's able to do all that. Two miles. And now she's able to use our YMCA membership to swim. That's a wonderful thing because I need her strength to come back. I need to address that sarcopenia that we are talking about. I am still aware that she's 72 and age will only increase, but it's a number. I cannot change that, but I can change how things progress. And what you don't see there is by the fourth week, the doctor had said, you know what, you don't have to take the Percocet anymore. So walking two miles, she comes back, she needs to use the bathroom. Physical therapists have that effect. It's a great thing. You walk, 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 you will need to use the bathroom. And not for, number one, it's for the heavy ones. For older people, that's a great thing. So, up till today, even though she's been discharged quite a while, I saw her a while back, she still tells me, because once in a while you get a card and say, you know, I still do my stretching, and she plans to compete in Senior Olympics. That was not part of the plan, but I'm grateful for it. So that's Miss Lucy tied back. I need your questions. Yes, ma'am. So how does your approach change where is it similar? If you have somebody who's got a fractured limb or a broken shoulder, you can still work through these same things with both sexes? Yes and no. I will still want to work through it, but that will be secondary. I have to address the localized tight shoulder, tight knee first. Because if there is joint contracture, then I have to remove that contracture. Because I'm depending on pure muscle response in this case. But with a tight knee, it's not just 
muscle tightness. No, there is changes in the ligamental structures. And that has to be a focused manual therapy stretch. And I have to get in there and do a grade three or grade four and actually work that. Then I'll come back to functional movement. So the combined movement that we do is actually functional. She wants to reach down to pick something. She wants to, um, I'm not sure you can see me. She wants to tie her shoe. She, you will tie your shoe like that. But I will ask her, Miss Lucy, you can still tie your shoe that way. I need you to open up and use your knees. But if she has contractures, she will be limited in how much she can do if I don't address that contracture. So there will be localized treatment for the joint contracture. And then I will give her combined movement stretching for that. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes ma'am. Right, that, that, that's the thing, and I do agree with that. Research does not support resting and immobilizing the shoulder. Immobilization actually makes things worse. But then, how do you compete with 2 a.m. TV commercial? They push you through the system, and, but it does not help them. The physiology of it is just not there. There is no evidence behind that. But it's popular, and it allows them not to move. It's like a child crying. You give them candy, or you say, work it out. You that says, work it out, is the mean one. The one that gives candy and rotten teeth is the good one. How do we fight against that? Braces, maybe if it's for stabilization. But most of the people that are asking you for the script, they are going to wear those braces and not do much. Yeah, the DME companies. Ah, oh, all right, that's a great one. I didn't know you could compare with that. But do you really care if you're looking out for them? Be because I'm thinking, <laughs> I, I'm thinking you are doing right by them. Maybe if we are. If we all, perhaps you have to pass it down through the chain. You are up there. Maybe some, some of us in that line, we are not listening or we are not hearing that. Do, should we, perhaps, have to have a unified voice? They are hearing it from the nurse. They are hearing it from the therapist, what they heard from their physician. That, look, this is not going to help. Maybe at the short term, it might help, but it's actually going to make you worse. You're going to lose your muscle mass, or you're going to do this, you're going to do that. Because they are hearing it. Why would somebody offer me that if, if it's not good for me? Oh, well. That's right. So it has to be an interdisciplinary agreement that if they need it, there has to be a strong indication for it. If there is neuro stability that you are looking at, oh yeah, maybe neuromuscular stability, that it's the purpose. But not if it's just for pain. If it's pain, then have the physical therapist work on it first before I sign off on it. No. There are people in my family we disagree, but then I guess we have to sit down and go through journals and evidence-based practice some more. <laughs> no. But you're right. But it, it's just like any profession. Sometimes we forget to keep ourselves updated. Uh, when somebody has wrist pain or sprained their um, ankle, we all give them braces. That was 25 years ago. 
when I was in PT school in the 80s, that was what we did. But is it right? Research has shown over the years that it's not right. But does that mean that all of us stop doing it? Unless Medicare issue a statement and say, we're not going to pay you. We're not going to listen. If it works or it's not broken, why fix it? But sometimes the one that knows better may have to force the hand of the one that is not doing well. So I don't know. Yes, sir. Yes, it's a sustained stretch. Yes. Repeated. For once you get to, I wish I had done what I did on him on you. Once you get to that range of motion, the stretching is end to a mean to get to range of motion. Once you get to that range of motion, it doesn't matter how long you hold it. But you have to stop them where you have to shut down the gate is when they have the tingling, the numbness. You say, no, you have stretched too long, ma'am. No, you have to stop. So the impact, that's a good question. With the cryo massage that I'm talking about, when I, I did it for the first two weeks, just to calm her down and get into that stretching. With cryo massage, same thing. If I'm doing the cryo massage, now I'm moving in a small circle, it's pinpoint. I go through the coldness of the eyes, I go through uh, pain of the eyes, I go through numbness, and it feels like pressure. I want them to talk to me and say, now it feels numb, like you're just rubbing something. I have to stop, because if I don't stop immediately, it becomes numb. Then eyes burn. Same thing with stretching. If you overstretch, then you start compressing the nerve, and the numbness or the tingling um, comes in. And that's over stretching. That's not appropriate. No. So in the steps I'd shown you, I said, oh, there will be conditioning. There will be, okay. So pre-stretching activity is, this is what I want you to do. Now try to reach it. So you do the same movement, but you're not stretching. You keep going back into the elastic and come back into the elastic, but real slowly. And then you come in and say, now can I stretch you? So same thing. So if you are going to go on a treadmill, we don't say, oh, stretch. No, not really but we want you to warm up. So if you're gonna walk at 8.5 miles an hour, or run at 8.5 miles an hour, we want you to warm up at 3.2 miles an hour. So the same motion at a decreased very low intensity, and that's the warm up. So it's going back to the neurophysiological response, telling the uh, muscles, this is what I'm gonna do, this is what I'm gonna do, this is what I'm gonna do, then you do it. Any more questions? Thank you for being such a great audience. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you.